and welcome to Possibility Project. This is the 42nd episode and the fourth season of Possibility Project. And the topic today is White Women's Tears, a never ending journey from whack to woke. And I'm so glad that you are here um, to join us for this really important conversation. And I am going to introduce myself and the show. If you are new to Possibility Project, if you've never been here to join in our community for any of those other 41 episodes, they're all on possibilityproject.org. You can check all of those recordings. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel um, to see all of those, and you'll get alerts, notifications when any new episode is posted. And again, all of them are on the website. And now that you have registered for this episode, I will send you messages unless you choose to unsubscribe. They will let you know about all future um, topics and I'll share what our next topic will be at the end of our time together today for April. So I'm Heather Cox. I'm the co-creator, host, and curator of this community and of this, this show, this sort of online talk show. Uh, Possibility Project started in March of 2020 when the world was so um, falling apart with, uh, with COVID and, and all of the racial justice uprisings and all of the work that was being done to disrupt social change. Um, a lot of the conversations that my co-creator at the time, Devin Davey, and I were having with our networks were so nourishing and so generative, and it made us feel so hopeful and connected that we've thought, well, this is sort of selfish that we have this space and these beautiful people in our lives that we're just hanging out with. Why don't we bring this to scale and to community? And it's just grown into this lovely network of amazing folks. So it's really trying to create greater meaning uh, for this time of change, and we've kept it going. Um, so I am the founder and the CEO of Pause for Change. I work with nonprofits, local governments, and philanthropy to teach them how to use new problem-solving skills. And I also just uh, published a book. It's now available online in any online retailer. You can go to nomorestatusquobook.com to learn more. And I want to mention that I am on the um, lands of the Tono Otam and the um, Pascoyaki people. And we acknowledge um, the land acknowledgement piece, but we know that's just one tiny, tiny piece of decolonizing our thinking. So I suggest that you learn more about this on nativeland.ca and there's a link also in that website. And I just wanna describe my personal appearance so you can see if you are visually impaired. Um, I have red hair, freckles, um, blue eyes. I'm wearing a, a white striped shirt with a blue background with some art behind me. And I'm so, so thankful thankful that you are here to join us in this conversation. And I just want to share a couple of the goals of Possibility Projects so you can uh, see why we come together and why we're here. So we're really focused on uniting a community of diverse change makers, stimulating new thinking and this thirst for deeper change, exploring collaboratively what's possible and examining our own role, starting with ourselves in the transformation. So I hope that that will guide our conversation today in your future engagement. It is a 100% volunteer project. We have something that's like a Patreon. It's a very um, wide open fiscal sponsor model where you can see everything that's happening within the, the finances. So it's all volunteer. If you would like to make a gift to support this work, we would love to have your support. It's opencollective.com slash possibility project. And I wanna talk through the agenda of what our time together will be. Um, we'll do intros in just a second. You'll hear from our amazing guests and you already saw their bios in the chat uh, or in the reminder email, excuse me. And um, we're gonna have them tell a little story about themselves in just a moment. And then you will meet another person. I'll open up some breakout rooms after they're done with their intros. And you'll meet another individual here just for a couple of minutes, just to share who you are and why you're here today. And then we'll, talk about our questions. We ask the same two questions every single episode. And the first is what dysfunction do we want to disappear related to the topic today? And then what's emerging that gives us hope? So what action can we take? What resources should we pursue? What's part of our learning and the work that we need to do as individuals and beyond moving forward? And then we'll have time for Q&A. And then we'll go back to breakout rooms with a small group of three people, if you can stick around that long. And that'll be time just to um, talk about what's resonating with you, what questions you're having, what are you thinking with another group of people that have been here today. And then we'll have some brief takeaways from our guests and I'll share the next episode. And I was texting uh, with my dear friend, Dr. Lakia Cherry, last night saying, can I mention your name when I talk about the why? Because um, Lakia and I were talking, and if you don't know Dr. Lakia Cherry, you really must find out about her work, and especially her Change Makers of Color projects. So I want to put that out there. Um, but Lakia and I were talking, and she said, you know what I want to see on Possibility Project? I want to see a panel of white women 
talking about their experiences around racial identity. And I thought, well, we've never done that because we don't typically have all white panels. It's it's not a priority of mine or of the show to really um, prioritize white voices. And so putting this together, I think we have the most beautiful panel of amazing folks that I was so honored and excited to have with us today. And I just invite you all to enter and join this space with an open heart, open mind, and just being welcomed to all these different perspectives that we bring to this. So that's what we're really going to navigate is what are uh, racial identity journeys of the white women here today. And so feel free to put all your thoughts and feelings in the chat, questions in the chat. I'll be touching upon the questions when we get to Q&A portion as well. So I want to um, just introduce our speakers. And like I said, we don't read their detailed bios because you had that in the reminder email. But we are joined today by Julie Ragland, Heather Mack, and Dr. Tema Oken. And I'm going to let them each introduce themselves, stop sharing my screen, so that they can tell you a little story about themselves. That's how we do introductions here on Possibility Project. So you get to know people pretty quickly. You get to a sense of who they are and uh, where they're coming from entering this, this topic today. And so I will stop sharing. And uh, please, um, Heather, do you want to introduce yourself first? I'm Heather Mack. I am coming to y'all from unceded, occupied Tongva land, what we call Los Angeles. Um, and I've been a program evaluator for maybe 20 years now. Okay, so uh, quick story. In 2018, uh, I burned out for the fourth time in my career. <laughs> um, and uh, sort of the work I was doing had to come to a screeching halt because I ran out of capacity, like completely. And um, in that time, I also developed a little bit of curiosity about my own uh, racism and discovered a group in Los Angeles of um, white anti-racists who come together in dialogue to grapple with their own ra racial identity journeys. Um, and the first session that I went to, there was a, a workshop being held and at the end of it, it was amazing. And then at the end of it, um, one of I overheard one of the facilitators say, oh, I forgot to mention that one thing. Oh, but you know, perfectionism is a characteristic of white supremacy culture. So I'm I'm just gonna let it go. And I'd never heard anything like that. And I made a beeline to that person and was like, I what? I need tell me everything. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, me getting connected to some of Dr. Oaken's work. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I continued on in that space, which um, was the big the jump started my um, racial identity journey and later uh, became one of the folks who facilitated orientation in that space. And the two things that I needed to hear every day uh, that I love to share with people is that. Um, we are all late to this conversation. We're already late. So the sense that some people have of them not having acting urgently enough, it's time. Right now is the right time. We're all late. Um, and the other piece is that our shame is not the ingredient that's missing from um, positive change going forward. So um, thank you. And let me turn it back over. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Tema, you want to go next? Oh, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. And you can please call me Tema. Everybody call me Tema. Um, so my story, I grew up, I, I live in Carborough, North Carolina. It's in the middle of the state. And I grew up in Chapel Hill, which is right next door and is the home of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And my father was a professor here. We moved, they moved from Brooklyn right after I was born. And I... I um, grew up during the very last days of Jim Crow segregation here in the South. And so I, when I went to high school, they were desegregating the schools. And the way they did that here and all across the South actually, but, but the way, um, speaking about my experience, the way they did that here was they, Chapel Hill High was the white high school, Lincoln High was the black high school. They built a whole new building on the edge of town 
and they called it Chapel Hill High, and they put all the students together in this building named after the white high school. They kept the white principal, the black principal became the vice principal. They fired all the black teachers, which was happening across the South, uh, and they hired a lot of new and less qualified, frankly, white teachers. They um, kept all the identity of the white school completely intact. The, the, the name of the, I think they might have kept Lincoln, the, they might have had the mascot might have been Lincoln's mascot, but they kept the, the sports names, the sports colors, the you know, all the all the. So it was like a transfer of the white high school, and black students were um, were told you have to go to this school and you know and have your whole experience wiped out, um, and so it caused a lot of um, a lot of distress among the black students, obviously. Um, so there, there were a lot of sit-ins and protests, and I was not at that time particularly, um, particularly conscious. Uh, I was uh, in high school. My hormones were raging. That's really all I cared about. Um, I wasn't really all that tuned in, but I did join a group called the Race Council, and we would meet at each other's houses to have conversations across race. And we had one at my house, and um, and in the I had a, I lived at my parents had. We lived in a ranch house, one of these sort of long houses with a upstairs and a downstairs. And the downstairs had a recreation room in it, and that's where we were meeting. And a young teen my age named Sylvester, African American, was saying to me, You're racist. And I was going, No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And that was our conversation. Um, I'm sure getting louder and louder. And then I finally just said, Okay, stop. I have to go get refreshments. So I go upstairs. And my mother, who's also white and grew up in Texas, turned to me and she said, uh, get a grip on yourself. You're a white girl growing up in a racist country. You're racist, deal with it. And um, and I my, I remember that very clearly. I don't remember if I went down, back downstairs and said to Sylvester, well, my mother just told me that you're right. What I do know is that in that moment, this gift that my mother gave me was that all that energy into going, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, turned into, oh, let me see how I am. And it's made, all the difference in my life for that to happen at such an early age. Um, and I, I thanked her for it uh, many times before she died. Yes, go mom. And so, uh, so I, that, that's my story, just that how that reframing early in my teens was really kind of set me on the path, um, set me on a path uh, to understanding racism and fighting for racial justice. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you so much. Julie. Thank you, Tama and Heather for those beautiful stories. Um, I'm Julie Ragland. I also come um, to you today from the traditional occupied unceded lands of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki people. Um, so I, I am now in Tucson, but my story starts uh, when I was growing up. I grew up in Racine, Wisconsin, which is um, Lake Michigan between Milwaukee and Chicago. And um, I was born in 1977. And when I was 12 years old in 1990, the movie Dances with Wolves was released. And uh, so I, I had learned a little bit about um, indigenous, the indi story of indigenous people from my, from my folks who are um, first generation progressives. Uh, but I went to see Dances with Wolves and at the end, by the end, I was absolutely inconsolable. I was absolutely devastated. And I cried and cried. And I think I went to see the movie like seven times because something was so important to me about um, that and about um, seeing, seeing the loss of culture. And I didn't realize that that's what it was until much, much later. It wasn't the love story between Kevin Costner and Mary McDonald or anything like that. It was the first time that I had seen a depiction of indigenous culture and seeing it lost. So by the end of the movie, it's apparent that, um, that the uh, indigenous people are being moved. They're being moved and there's a genocide happening. And so that is really where my story starts. That's the first time that I realized that there's culture outside my own and that there was a loss of that culture that happened. And the way that that culture was depicted, this um, really, um, apparent connection with 
uh, with the earth and with each other um, was was so devastating to me. And I didn't realize it until later when I um, studied anthropology and then finally went on to um, to become an inclusion, diversity, equity, and access uh, uh, consultant and, and teacher. Um, but that's really where my story begins. And uh, later I, I, I studied um, anthropology. And so looking at other cultures and looking at culture has always been important to me, but it's only been within maybe the past five to seven years that I've started to look at myself, my culture, my ancestry, and start to understand my place in all of this. Um, and so that's my story. It's <laughs> it's uh, really the first, and it's a, one reason why this um, this title of White Women's Tears resonated with me. And you know, we'll talk later about White Women's Tears in in kind of a different context. But that's where my story starts. It's with it's with tears because of understanding innately, even if I didn't understand it conceptually, the loss of culture that I was seeing depicted. Mm -hmm. Thank you each for sharing those stories. And so we want to jump into the first of our two questions, which is why we're here, right? So um, the question we always ask is what dysfunction connected to this topic do we want to have disappear and it's a time for each of our speakers to just say all the things I tell them like it's your moment it's your time to say all the things you can go full negative whatever you want to talk about that's your time so each of our speakers will take time to do that and then we'll transition to our next question so um, Heather will you go first and answer that question for us sure uh, if as long as by all the things you mean all the things I can fit in this much, was, <laughs> yes. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's a good clarification. Yes. Okay. Um, so the dysfunction that I need to see disappear from our sector is white supremacy culture. And um, but when I say white supremacy culture, I'm including that and as an umbrella that includes colonial violence and uh, capital capitalists, patriarchy, and so on. Um, so I have since 2018 been trying to disentangle white supremacy culture from my own work as a program evaluator. My thinking was that like, that's the area I have the most influence over. So surely um, I can show up in a way that won't be perpetuating white supremacy culture there. And um, so that's what I've been working on for the last five years. And I have come to the devastating conclusion that there is no disentangling my work from the perpetuation of white supremacy culture. And therefore I am what needs to disappear from the sector. Um, so essentially without white supremacy culture, our, let me speak on behalf of the nonprofit NGO sector, which is the one that I am have spent the most of my time and energy in and my career in. Um, our sector is rooted in white supremacy culture. And without that, we would not have uh, the sector that is familiar to us today. Um, so some of the things I learned along the way included um, from Chicago Beyond, there's a guidebook called Why Am I Always Being Researched that invited us to pose the question, how much freer are people? How much more agency do people have after they've engaged with our programs? Um, and that was part of my learning is that a lot of the programs are not generally funded to help people get freer. Um, and so, what has had to happen as a result of that is just, just a ton of grieving. My personal identity, my longing to do good and my longing to like be a good person have been deeply wrapped up in my uh, career choices. And um, so it has been grieving the, grieving the fact that my sincerity and dedication um, could still lead to the recreation of harm. Um, so I wanna just say that I also am coming with, I do not bring answers today. I bring questions and an openness 
to more questions <laughs> and a longing to be in space with people who are also sitting with questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's powerful to say I'm showing up with my experience, but I don't have the answers to, to lead and guide everyone. And I think that's how we need to show up to a lot of these, a lot of these conversations, this one included. Oh, I want to hear from you, Tema. This is a really, really hard one um, to answer with one answer. <laughs> There's so many things I want to see disappear uh, from my dysfunction. So I think I want to speak to the things I feel like I am um, learning the most now from the people who are, uh, I think, think of as teaching me in this moment. And a couple of them are Autumn Brown and Sandolo Di Mane and Lamarad Owens and Susan Raffo and Kara Page and most, most not all, but not all people of color, mostly queer. Um, and I think that that what they are teaching me and what I'm so excited to see perking up, perking up um, from these wise people is this um, real clarity that I, our identities inform us, but they don't define us. And um, and what that means is that you know it's it's so interesting because whiteness was constructed with this idea that that being white con conveys confers means more wisdom more more um, truthfulness, more uh, validity, more, you know, that, that whiteness, um, that being white and whiteness uh, confers value. Um, and I guess what I'm, I'm and, and then I think sometimes the, the way that we handle it in trying to do anti-racist work is to say, oh, it's the opposite, whiteness um, and being white confers uh, whatever the opposite is, no, no value, no, like having to shrink, having to to keep, keep keep quiet, having no wisdom to offer, having no, and um, and I think that 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 what I'm what I'm hearing again from teachers is that being um, being a victim uh, when we're oppressed. So I think about this as a woman or as an older person. Um, when we're on the uh, oppressed side of things, uh, we are being victimized, but our power does not lie in being a victim. Or in being harmed, or in the fact that we're being harmed, the power lies in in the ways that we individually and collectively figure out to navigate and survive that, and the great wisdom that comes from um, uh, this the the language that that I hear people using and that I'm starting to use is this wounding, this this grave wounding, this violent wounding of white supremacy or sexism or patriarchy or ageism or whatever it is, and I think that the the, the challenge for those of us on the uh, on the um, oppressor collusion side of things is that we um, we don't have the same. We are also wounded by um, th there are great wounds and to me and, and great trauma associated with with harming uh, being part of the harm equation. That the you know, all we have to do is think about when we've caused harm to someone and if we're honest with ourselves, how terribly bad bad that feels. And so um, there are wounds, but we're not, we have no experience, we have very little experience exploring those wounds or understanding what it means to justify things that can't be justified. I think about, I don't think it's an exact parallel, but I think about veterans who come back from war with severe PTSD and, um, and, you know, I'm not suggesting at all that white people have PTSD. I am suggesting that it's an example of how we in, have so internalized justifications for things that can't be justified that it's really twisted, um, twisted what it means to belong to whiteness. And so, and, and then the final thing I want to say is that to me, the, the challenge here, or the, the, I don't like to use the word warlike um, language, so I'm not, I, I want to say enemy, but that's not the right word. The, the, the challenge that we, we face is whiteness. It's not, it's not, um, you, you know, one of my teachers, Sandola says, you know, whiteness has nothing, he's an African-American and she's an African-American. They're an African-American um, genderqueer, uh, wonderful leader. And they say that um, whiteness has nothing that I want. And I think the more of us in the white group who start to understand that whiteness has nothing that we want. So being white isn't the issue. It's that It's that we belong to this thing called whiteness and we have to, understand that it's not personal, it's not about us, it's about our conditioning. Um, and so when my mother told me I was racist, what I would have been even, even a more wise thing to say 
was you have you're full of racist conditioning. You yourself are marvelous and fabulous and a beautiful human being, and you're full of racist conditioning, and you need to deal with that. Um, so that, I think that's where I'll, I'll leave it. So much more I want to say though. <laughs> And there, there's time and there's time, there's time. Well, the conversation involves, thank you for sharing that and adding that clarity of, you know, new, new wording, new ways that your mom could have, <laughs> could have brought that to your attention, right? And as part of your evolutionary journey from that exact transformative moment. And obviously all the work that you've um, put out into the world for us to, to learn from. Julie, I want to hear from you. Yeah, so the, the, the thing I want to talk about in terms of dysfunction within our sector is the expectation that it is the job of Black and Indigenous people of color to lead the movement towards anti-racism within our entities and organizations. So we see this over and over as consultants where, um, where we're being contacted by someone within the organization saying, um, you know, we've got our, our group together, our DEI group together or whatever. And, um, you know, we're, we're expecting the, the one person of color to come and lead this group, right? And that's really not how this should work. So as white people, we should be drawing, um, as, as Tama said, on bodies of work on, uh, from um, Black and Indigenous people of color. We should be creating authentic relationships with Black and Indigenous people of color. Um, but those of us who hold power and privilege need to be courageous and say, okay, I will lead this and then, um, and then make the cultural changes and then the systemic changes to support that. So I'll give an example, which is that, um, um, I've been involved for a few years um, in the local association of fundraising professionals chapter. And um, as you can imagine, um, the, the fundraising, the development sector is largely white and female. Um, and so for many years, our local chapter was always led by white women, primarily white women, always, always, always in the, in the leadership positions. So in 2018, I'd been involved in the organization and led a committee. And in 2018, I was approached by the, the, uh, the current pre president of the chapter who was a white woman and the previous chapter who was a white woman. And they said, would you be the incoming president for our chapter? Meaning I would be president, I elect through 2019, president in 2020. I said, only, yes, but only if we make inclusion, diversity, equity, access, our main focus, our main priority. And they said, okay, so that was great, right? I didn't have um, pushback there. And, um, and luckily, and this may be because um, the Tucson community is, is fairly progressive, um, and our nonprofit sector is fairly progressive, um, I did not have pushback from our local uh, chapter when I became, um, when I was asked to be in a leadership role and focus primarily on inclusion, diversity, equity, access. And so when I became president, um, I invited people of color who I had created authentic relationships with to come and join um, the group, to come and join the board. And, um, you know, we'd done work to make sure it, it, that it felt like a safe place. And so, we created this, um, you know, pipeline of people to to bring into leadership. Um, now I've cycled off of that board, and the next three, the current president is a woman of color. The next president after that is a woman of color, um, and so we've we created that um, because I said, no, this is what we're going to do. We're going to focus on this. If you if you want leadership, we're focusing on this. So. Those of us who have, you, you know, whether you're growing into a leadership role on, on, the, on a top level or you're asked to participate in something or there's an opportunity to participate in something, participate and use your power and your privilege and your voice to further, uh, to further this work. And so I think that that's the dysfunction I see is this expectation that, um, that it should be Black and Indigenous people of color um, who are... Uh, I don't want to say leading the movement because they are leading the movement, but we need to be in leadership um, 
calling our um our our power and privilege into play in a way that that furthers this work in a really vocal way thank you for that and for that example of what it can look like to step into the leadership role and really um, ask an organization to to be different and to show up differently yes and we've had multiple um, conversations as part of possibility project episodes of how that falls on BIPOC folks of so you'll lead the charge you'll 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 take the harm you won't be compensated fairly you won't be um cared for in those roles and then having that burnout and then having that you know another level another level another level of frustration and pain so thank you for that so we're going to shift gears because we like to ask that second question and what's emerging that gives you hope who are those teachers that are expanding your thinking? What are those resources that we all should access? What are the new actions and behaviors we can take and explore to really move differently in this space around this topic? So um, Tema, I would love for you to go first and share, you know, what are you seeing? What's giving you hope? What's emerging? And all of the resources I'll say before you start um, that our speakers offer and have already offered, you know, outside of this conversation that you offer in the chat, I put all of those in the takeaway email that you'll get about 48 hours after today. It'll have the recording, it'll have key takeaways and all resources. So this is part of that shift. So if you have items to offer, please put those in the chat. And as you start to think of questions, please start to put those in the chat as well, because that'll be our next stop. Okay, Tema, I'd love to hear what's emerging that gives you hope. Well, I, I've already, um, I seem to break the rules right off the bat. I already answered that a little bit in the last question. Um, <laughs> so I to go to <laughs> but I will say, you know, as someone, um, so I've been, I've been in this, in this movement for a very long time. Um, my birthday is tomorrow. I turned 71 years old. So I've been doing this for quite a while and uh, what gives me hope is the incredible um, arc of learning that I feel like the movement and then so that's I'm play, that's where I place myself and then all of us who do uh, racial justice work, um, however you define that, that that we have really come a long way since I started. And you know when when you named this white women's tears, I could tell you that when I first started doing this work, which was in the oh my gosh, early 80s, um, that it was predictable. I, I was working with, first with a, a group of colleagues at the at a place called Grassroots Leadership, and then with my mentor and colleague Kenneth, Kenneth Jones for twelve years. And in those early days, it was completely predictable that there would be a white woman who would cry at every anti-racism, racial, you know, racial justice workshop um, from a place of uh, this is too hard for me. I'm going to cry and make everybody pay attention to me and make me feel better because that's the only way I know how to be in relationship with my own racist conditioning um, is, to, is, to, is to cry um, and make and be the center of tension and make people take care of me and, and get the whole workshop off of track and, and particularly ask the people of color to validate that I'm one of the good white people. So, um, so I think that I've, I've seen this incredible arc and, and to a place where I, I feel like that that happens. I, I don't see that as much at all. I think I think there's been this understanding. And another thing that I used to to teach, um, I still do. Uh, but it, it's, it's it's there's progress been made. As I would talk about how if we think about the white community or, or, or white people as a line, and on one end of the line are all the people who are um, vocally and embodiedly in in every way uh, living into a racist agenda. And on the other end of the line are, are all the, those of uh, people who identify as anti-racist. So one of the first things I do is ask people to name individuals and groups on the racist side. And people can do that really easily, generally. And then I ask people, and this is white people, and I do this in white affinity groups. Um, I ask white people to name who are the people who've been anti-racist and been doing anti-racist organizing. And it's pretty, pretty often true that people don't know that history as well, because there's a strong history of white anti-racist organizing throughout since racism began. So there, that it highlights that, and then I say that in the middle are most white people who are taught by this culture that um, that if you're not personally, if you don't have racist intent, then racism isn't happening. Don't understand racism as institutional or cultural or or um, structural, and and think that if you know, and, and so they're they're sort of living 
they're living out this um, reality where, where it's sort of like what I was doing in the basement. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. And and the way that the way that white supremacy culture is so clever is it has encouraged people who identify as anti-racist to draw a, to draw a wall and say I'm not like those white people. I'm woke or I'm 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 anti-racist. I understand what's going on. I'm going to go help communities of color. I'm going to go help indigenous people. Um, and I'm going to distance myself from white people, leaving these people, leaving this group to be organized by racist white people. And that's what we've seen happen over and over and over and over again. What I see, the change I've been seeing, you know, and I was I was uh, very involved in showing up for racial justice, which is um, a, a group that with the mission of organizing white people to show up for racial justice. What I've seen happen in my 35 years is more and more white people understand that we have a response that first of all, we're not all that different from anybody else on the line that, you know, no matter how, I mean, I've been doing this work forever and not forever. I've been doing this work for a long time, most of my lifetime. And I still have racist thoughts. I still act out of my racist conditioning. This is a lifetime project. So um, I sort of, I, I understand that I'm on the line with everybody else and that, that it's really important for me to be in relationship with people um, in the middle and to not come to come at people from a place of shame and blame and to understand that um, it's part of what my answer was before that it's really I feel like my role and everybody there's so many roles to play so there's not one way to do this but at this point in my life my role is to help white people identify our direct stake in racial justice so that it's not about well, I'm, I'm doing this from a moral imperative to help people of color because then it gets all distorted and it's all about assimilation into whiteness and it's it's not particularly useful. Uh, we need to be art able to articulate why racial justice matters to us individually and collectively um, and why our lives and souls and and hearts and minds are on the line too. So that's what I would say. But I've seen great I've seen great movement and progress uh, in, in all of those ways. Thank you for that. That perspective is invaluable about what you have seen over these three decades. So, so important. Heather, I wanna hear from you. With all that you shared of you know, wanting to exit the sector that you remove yourself, I really wanna know what gives you hope and where that shining light is for you that, that you're moving towards or not having answers, more about that space. Yeah. Um, Emma, you just reminded me that um, one of the things that has stuck with me since I entered the movement was um, that uh, people have a tendency to think that the point in time when they entered a movement is when the movement really started. Um, and I saw that in myself that I got like, uh, I'm a little, I'm a little history buff. So uh, the possibility that there's actually been um, a long history of anti-racist resistance um, has been a big, very meaningful part uh, for me and also reminding me uh, that this is uh, not a sprint, this is a relay race. Um, so uh, for me, what gives me hope is um, everything that I've learned about the Black feminist resistance. And that includes, um, there's a big sort of queer contingency within that. Um, I didn't understand that there has been an unbroken um, constant of Black feminist resistance um, that's been invisibilized, but going on for hundreds of years um, and is still active and thriving today. Um, what draws me to that is that the vision of the future from a Black feminist lens resonates so deeply with my vision of the future. Um, and then not only that, it's really an expansive um, idea of that vision. And the more and more I lean into and learn about 
that expanded vision of the future, um, the more I find it just irresistible. Um, so that is giving me tremendous hope. Um, and part of what I understand from that Black feminist lens is that the means we use to create the future we're creating um, are gonna determine what the future looks like when we get there. Um, so, you know, I've got Audre Lorde in the back of my head, the master's schools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, and so it sort of solves that question for me about um, how I show up in this space. And it clarifies for me that I uh, have a responsibility to unlearn my racist conditioning, which is, yeah, permanent process. I am very comfortable saying I'm super racist. I am very dedicated to not acting out and to continuing to unlearn that conditioning. And yet it's, it's core. So it requires my concentration and it requires my dedication. And that's, you know, the other thing that gives me a tremendous amount of hope is um, getting to share space with other white folks who are supporting one another in the grappling with the way we're showing up with our racist conditioning. I particularly, I was raised by some social workers, so I have white saviorism in my genes. Um, it, it's violent, and I didn't understand previously that I could possibly do harm with such good intentions. And now I understand that. And I also understand that part of my part is um, observing my urge to act out those compulsions and sitting with that and also grieving that uh, white supremacy made me a bargain, made all of us a bargain that if we just assimilate and perform whiteness, perfectly constantly, then we will get to be safe from this sort of harmful social crisis we're in. Um, and that bargain, it turns out not to have been actually true in the first place. And also a terrible bargain for not getting to live, um, having to internalize white supremacy. Um, is really what the bargain was. If you just buy into that you, anyway, I mean, not, I'm done now. Uh, okay, I'm gonna step back. So I'm gonna just say, uh, Kiaga Yamada Taylor has a edition of the Kambahi, Kambahi River Collective Statement in a book called How We Get Free. Um, and that's been paradigm shifting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, so many things you both have said. Michael Bryan, who has been, um, he led a, a special workshop. Uh, Michael Bryan's from Human Nature. He's in Philly. And he talks about what we, when we design, and we're all designers, right? When we create programs, policies, processes, procedures, visions, we're imagining the future on behalf of other people. And when you look at a sector that's primarily white led, and hasn't done the work that I have seen. Um, and we have some bright examples, but um, can you imagine that future that's being imagined on behalf of others based on our lens and this, this, these broken perspectives? So um, thank you for talking about that experience, Heather, and, and that white saberism is fierce in this sector. It is fierce. Uh, Julia, I wanna hear from you. What's, what gives you hope? What do you wanna point us to? Yeah, there's a couple of things. One is the community centric fundraising movement. So I've been in development and fundraising for about 15 or so years. And like most people was very donor centric, right? That's the lens that we had in this, you know, nonprofit kind of poverty mentality and go, go, go all the time. Um, and now with the community centric fundraising movement, which is a movement that's emerging out of the, the Northwest, um, kind of founded by 
Boule, who um, for years has had a really um, influential and hilarious blog that's now called Nonprofit AF, um, is a shift from donor centrism to community centrism. And so it's not a shift away from like, you know, having relationships with your donors or loving your donors, but it's saying, no, we're not going to be driven by what donors want. We're going to be driven by what the community needs. And there, um, there are 10 different kind of fundamental tenets to the movement, which is an emerging movement. And, and they really aren't only for development. It's really uh, or for organizational change. And it's really just shifting focus um, so that the community needs come first. And when we say community, it's um, external community, like who are you serving through your mission, but also internal community. So how are you treating your employees? How is equity being displayed through your internal culture, through your internal processes and procedures? Um, they have a great website, um, communitycentricfundraising.org. That's where, um, through the resources section, I first became um, aware of uh, Tama's work and that, um, and her work with the characteristics of white supremacy has been really influential for me in terms of looking at what element, what insidious elements of white supremacy um, I am participating in and how when I realize something is a characteristic of white supremacy, um, I can decide to distance myself from that. I can decide to opt out of that. And that is really liberating. Um, uh, so definitely check that out, the community-centric fundraising movement. The other thing that I would um, talk about, and I've seen so many great uh, resources coming through the chat, and um, one of them was My Grandmother's Hands by Rizma Minicom, and um, that is um, pertaining to this movement now towards somatic embodiment, somatic anti-racism work, somatic abolitionism. Um, and that has been majorly influential um, for me as well. And I'm so glad to see that we are now starting to approach this from an embodied um, perspective. Um, so for me, that has meant, um, you know, reading his book, working his book with other people, learning how to be in communication with my own nervous system, learning how to understand what my body is telling me when I'm showing up in a space to do this work. Um, and it has also led me to understand my ancestry. Um, and so I now understand that, um, that I come from um, a history of slave owners. So my, my, my family name is a slave owner's name. My, na my last name, Ragland, um, for example, is um, Meghan Markle's mother, Doria Ragland's last name. So you can see um, where, where my history comes from. And so, Part of the work I do is, is, um, is work with my ancestors to um, metabolize the historical uh, racialized trauma that they carried and that I carry so that um, I, when I show up and do this work, it's from a place of, of a grounded nervous system. And, and that's really kind of the main point of Resma's work is that if we're gonna move forward and build new culture, right? Dismantle uh, white supremacy and move forward to build new culture, um, we need to do it from an embodied perspective. And if we're not going to, if we, if, you know, we can't just do this work in our heads conceptually, it has to come from our hearts and our bodies. So that's the other thing that's emerging. That's so exciting for me. And, and I'm also so glad to see that other people um, are also um, participating in that as well. I saw that there's an embodied um, certificate program happening. I saw it through Facebook, but it was, it's a number of different um, somatic practitioners, including Resma, um, that's starting soon. So maybe I, I, I can maybe uh, look for that while somebody else is speaking. Great, thank you so much. That is so key, the somatic response piece in that book is so, so good. Many people have posted, so that's great. Check that out and I'll put that in the resources as well. Um, and I have a post-it note, it's funny. I have my laptop put on a, um, a Kleenex box. <laughs> That's what I do to like give it a little lift. I find that it works pretty well unless you start sneezing and then you have to disrupt the whole thing. But <laughs> but you'll see this, this sticky note and it says comfort and smugness of whiteness. And George A said that um, in one of our earlier episodes and I won't tell you his whole story. Check it out. Check out George A. He's amazing. A great, a good studio in Chicago. But George had said that 
as part of his own his own identity journey, um, this feeling of the the comfort and smugness of whiteness, and that has never left me. And that's the sensation I look for. That's the cue that I'm like, no, uh, -uh. what is this? What is that? So it makes me it made me think about that somatic response and, and that provocation that, that he offered and sharing his own story. If you have questions for our guest, I would love for you to put those in the chat. I do have one that I want to seed. And if you do have to hop off, many of you will be sending us love notes in the chat and saying goodbye. So we appreciate you being here. We understand that sometimes things can only have an hour. Um, you will get the, the full recording. So anything that you miss, you won't hear what happens in breakout rooms, but you'll get the rest of it. So you'll hear the Q&A. Um, so thank you for being here. But those of you who can stick around, we'll do Q&A. We'll spend time in breakout and community where you can talk to other people. Um, to just, you know, process and think through this. But one question I have for you is, is for you, Tema. And it's, you mentioned in the chat, like, click on this link, look at this, not the other stuff. And you've recently had articles that are talking about how your characteristics of white supremacy culture have been misused and weaponized. Can you speak to that? Because I think there are many people here that are familiar with your work that I think I, I want to, I want to put light on that. Yeah. Well, one of the dysfunctions that I didn't talk about is the way in which, um, you know, we live in a culture that loves to make, make complex things simple and, you know, and reduce things to a checklist. Um, and white supremacy is nothing and racism is nothing if not deeply complex and adaptable and devious and ever changing um, with the conditions. And so, uh, without going into too much about the history of the, of the article, it, the, the article is an att one attempt among many um, to uh, help people understand what white supremacy culture is and how it gets in our way. Uh, it gets in the way, uh, you know, my, my basic um, definition of white supremacy is, is, is anything that disconnects us, the ways in which Racism disconnect us from each other across lines of race within our own racial groups, from ourselves personally, from the earth and the land and the wind and the sun, and from uh, spirit, the divine, our ethical tradition, whatever it is that people draw draw on. And so this um, this this list or the, the the article was an attempt to say here are some of the manifestations. Perfectionism, the one that you ran into um, or that Heather ran into, uh, is is one of them as ways to kind of get our get our minds around um, how, how's it showing up in our bodies. And I, I love what you said about, um, what Julie said about the importance of, of this growing movement of embodiment and understanding of what's going on in our bodies. And so um, I think what happens is that um, people take this, um, it's a, it's, it is kind of a list or it's a, it's a, description of a number of different manifestations of white supremacy culture, make it into a checklist and then say, okay, now I'm going to use this as a checklist to decide whether you're acting out of white supremacy or not. And um, a lot of people have used it like that. I do find when I investigate further that a lot of people who use it like that haven't actually read the article. Um, and one of the reasons why I urge people to go to the website is because the, the article was originally, I originally wrote this in 1999 as part of work I was doing with Kenneth Jones and change work. And it was put in a, in a workbook. And this was before Al Gore invented the internet or as Al Gore was inventing the internet. And um, that's my little joke for the day. But the, but the, the and, and so then somebody um, at another workshop took it out, took that piece out and put it on the internet and it started to float around of its own will. Um, and I tried to capture it and and, you know, work with it but that was was hard to do and then when when um george floyd was murdered it really it really took off and it's it's and and i realized i've got to do you know it was quite old by then i i really have to revise it and update it and put a class lens in it and talk about people not weaponizing it and that's where the web website came from and i recently changed the home page to explain to people that the website is not an article it's a book and I didn't publish it as a book because I wanted it to be accessible to anybody, totally free. I wanted to be able to link it to resources and I wanted to be able to change and revise it as, as new information became available. So um, it's not meant 
this is not meant to be used as a checklist to to weaponize to say to to say to people here's here's how you're being bad in the world. It's meant to say first it's it's very well used as a reflection tool, a, a collective collaborative cl uh, reflection tool like how are we getting in our own way, and as a beginning to understand that so that we can vision the kind of culture that we want because culture is so important the way we are it's the way we are with each other it's what we value it's what we care about how we care for each other so it's so important and it's so important that we vision it in a way that makes sense and encourages and supports all of us to thrive. So the best use of it is like, here are some ways that, it, that it's showing up in my body. Here are some ways that it's showing up in our group. What do we want to do about it? Not to go after people. Um, and it's such a, it's such, such a simplification of very complex material. And so I'm, I'm really begging people not to do that. And if you see people doing that, to, to stop them and say, this is not how it's meant to be used. Let's go and look at the website and let's, you know, take a piece out and read it. I don't expect anybody to read it at once. It's very dense, but but to really understand and really appreciate um, that that understanding white supremacy culture takes some time and some grappling. And it's not, it's it's only it's only cooperating with and 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 falling into white supremacy culture to use it in that way. Let's go, oh yeah, we're gonna, oh yeah, now we have a list that we can beat each other up. Great. <laughs> Thank you for adding clarity. And like you said, we all have a role to play to take action when people are misusing it and to inform them of the intention and additional resources. So definitely. So there's a question that someone had put in the chat um, about talking about a resource uh, besides raising white kids, which is fantastic. They say Stephanie is saying that. Hi, Stephanie. Do you have thoughts, resources for caregivers, of white children? Just like Tema, your mom was like, hey, wake up, you're racist. Um, what do you as speakers have any recommendations um, for what you've used with your own children, other children, what you were thinking? Um, I will offer that um, the space that uh, the white affinity space that um, I've been involved with um, called the Alliance of White Anti-Racists Everywhere, there's stuff in the resources, um, is a collection of folks across the entire public. It's not, um, well, it's a cross-section of white folks, but um, people aren't coming there as like part of the sector or related to their work. So there's several folks who come um, specifically with their own role as parenting new humans um, in why in their sort of focus for how they're sh shaping the future. Anyway, um, there are white parents who are gathering together to sort of own that and work together and support each other in that space. I haven't made any people, so I have not involved with that space but there are, they do exist, um, as well as lots of uh, resources. I know Ibram X. Kendi created a um, kid version of how to be an anti, mm, might be called how to raise an anti-racist actually, but step back. Yes, that's what I was thinking, um, that book, yeah, Dr. Kendi's work. There's also about a million good kids books out right now. Yes, yes. And Julie or Tama, any recommendations, any ideas, suggestions? No, I put something in the chat. Uh, I love the Black History resources at Urban Intellectuals. They have like Black History flashcards. I mean, I think in addition to, um, you know, like how to raise an anti-racist, um, you know, exposing your kids to as many different cultural, different cultures and cultural elements as possible is really important as well, right? Like get, get your kids out there, get them involved in, in cultural events and just, you know, do everything you can to kind of raise their cultural awareness and do that also through role modeling, you know, through, um, through educating yourself. So. Yeah. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Uh, I'm not a parent. And so this is the area I don't know very much about, except to say, I will say that, um, the late great Maya Angelou, I think, was the one who said, I think she's the one who said, you know, if if there's a book you're trying to read and you can't find it, then you should write it. And it's like if there's a if there's a need you have around uh, around this as a parent and you can't find it, then it is an invitation. Not that 
I'm not assuming anybody has time, but it is an invitation to say, oh, maybe I could do this. And it could be as simple as finding three other parents who want to do it and saying, well, what are we going to read? What are we going to do? So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, we, we can be we can be the people we're looking for. If, if. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I have two kiddos. I, I like the, the driving time. The driving time I refer to as my indoctrination time <laughs> of when I can have conversations with the kids. It's changed now that they're teenagers, of course. Um, but that's that's when we tend to have most of our conversations, which is fascinating, where we can go deep and, and talk about um, institutional racism, systemic racism, what that looks like in our community. And as we go all throughout our community, then we can have different conversations about how things look different. What do the roads look like? What do the houses look like? What do the schools look like? That's by design. Who who designs that? How how can they be involved in all that? So that's that's one thing I would throw in a little bit. All right. So um, April thirteenth, nine thirty to eleven Pacific, we are going to talk about trust and what does it mean to be trustworthy in the social sector. We have three amazing guests once again: Sabrina Maharali, Terrence Smith, and Pian Fonte. So we're going to talk about trust in design and co-design, trust in local government, trust in philanthropy. They have such a diversity of perspectives that um, talking about who, who defines what trust is, what is trust, what does it mean to lose and gain trust, what's the power dynamics related to trust, and what does it mean to be trustworthy or not, and how can we be in, in right relationship around trust. So I hope you will come back in the um, takeaway email at the very bottom. Underneath all the resources will be an invitation to this next one with a link, but I'll also put the link in the chat and I will add it to the website today, or maybe two days when I add the recording, I'll add the new episode to the website. So I wanna hear from our speakers, just um, any of our speakers unmute. I wanna hear some parting words. Um, what's the takeaway that you wanna leave us with from our conversation today? And I'm sure you're percolating on your great breakout room as well. What do you wanna leave us with? Heather, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure. Um, partly because of what we were discussing in the breakout room. Um, I want to clarify that um, I am leaving the sector. And for me, that is not the same as uh, it is a fairly common response for white folks grappling with their own, confronting their own racism to uh, take their toys and go home. Um, and that is not uh <laughs> that is not what's happening here i haven't discovered that i've done harm and like hung my head in shame and taking my toys and go home um i'm rededicating myself to the abolition movement and um that is a movement led by folks of color and as um somebody who came up in like education and nonprofits and stuff i got a lot of um like professional development around my own leadership skills. And so I know how to be in charge of stuff. And I know how to cooperate with other people who are leading the way I've been taught to lead. Um, part of what I'm working on right now is what it means to be in like fellowship, especially in spaces that are led by folks of color, um, especially when I have been taught smugness that I know better than other people how stuff should get run and how change would actually happen. Um, so, and the work that I am rededicating myself to is um, a lot of it's been criminalized and a lot of it is unfundable from a, anything familiar uh, to the model of the work that I've been involved with so far throughout my career. Um, so we don't have to take our toys and go home. We can sit in the discomfort of, um, not knowing yet how to be in fellowship and practicing anyway. Absolutely. Oh, thank you for that. I, think I would say, um, at the risk of, of, I don't know, at the risk of what, that I, I feel like at this point in my life and uh, that I'm very clear that I need to do, be doing this work from a place of deep and very fierce and radical love. And I'm not talking about a Pollyanna love. I'm not talking about a Hallmark card, cotton candy kind of love because love is hard. 
love is really, really hard. Loving myself has been really hard to do. I'm still still in practice. Loving all of you, really hard to do, as fabulous as you are. Um, and you know, it, it can mean setting boundaries. It can mean knowing when I can show up and when I need to take a rest. It can mean um, really practicing when people are difficult. Um, and it does mean, as my as the late as my friend uh, Cynthia Brown, who died way too early, said that we don't throw anyone away. We don't throw anyone away. And um, but I may have to be out of the room. Uh, I may need to leave the room, but I don't throw you away. So you know, I, I just think it, being in this practice of deep and fierce and radical love is 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 what grounds me as I do this work. Um, and I'm so deeply grateful to each and every one of you for choosing to spend time with us today and thank you for all you are and all you do. Thank you for that. Wait, hey, Julie. I think, yeah, I think, I think um, one of the things I want to leave everyone with is that this work can feel deeply contradictory, right? So as, as white folks, it's like, we're supposed to sit down and be quiet, but we're supposed to speak up. And the work is very urgent, but it has to unfold in its own time, right? There are so many inherent contradictions in this work that it can feel immobilizing, it can feel overwhelming. And so um, my, my kind of call to you all is to, is to understand that that inherent contradictory nature exists and to not let it stop us from doing the work that needs to be done. So even though um, we're, we're working sometimes in this liminal space between those things where we don't know what to do, is it right to sit down? Is it right to speak up? Um, you know, do we let something unfold in its time or do we push something through urgently because it needs to happen? Um, and so, you know, I, I go back a lot to that characteristics of white supremacy um, uh, a work by by Tema to look at that and go, okay, am I, you know, how can I, how can I use this to help guide me through whatever situation I'm in? So um, I just, I, I also want to just thank all of you for showing up for this conversation. You know, it's, these are not hard, uh, are not easy conversations to have. And, um, and so just thank you to everyone who showed up and engaged in this. We appreciate you all. And thank you to the other speakers. Thank you to, to Heather for hosting. Yes, yeah. thank you, Heather, and thank you, Tama and Julie, for this opportunity. I'm really grateful to be here with everybody who is here today and to have learned so much from all of y'all. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's such an honor. Just I just say it like I hold I create the container, and then the magic appears. The magic comes. Magic people. Magic thoughts and words and and love. I really love that that offering to us, Tama. I think it's wonderful as a departure for us to stick to. And then I, I want to read it exactly what you said. And I put a big circle, deep, fierce, and radical love. And I love that you reinforced that love is hard. Love is not easy. Love is complex. Love is confusing. Love is exciting and deeply sad. Love is all the things and love is all that is. And so I, I really appreciate we could all show up to this space together. So thank you, Julie, Heather, and Tema for being with me and for saying yes. There are a lot of white ladies that I could think of my network. They'd be like, yes, please put me on that episode, right? <laughs> Most people would be like, no thanks. I will. The discomfort, right? And and please check out previous episodes we've had um, around radical allyship, about anti-racist evaluation and design. So many threads tie into this work that I hope you'll you'll explore those. Um, so check out the next episode and you'll get that email within about 48 hours with the recording, key takeaways, resources, and the invitation for next time. Okay, bye-bye. Take good care.